that's very bad. Uh, like, like people are like, wouldn't it be great if everyone used Bitcoin, Peter? And my answer is maybe, but only if there's a privacy layer built on top of Bitcoin that actually you know protects people from just being targeted by malicious third parties, by corrupt states, by all the people who would potentially target somebody and use all of this very private, intimate information about their past financial transactions against them, which people will do. Like, if, 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 you, if you buy the right products, you're going to get mail that wants to sell you more products because they think you're pregnant or something like that. And these are, these are very, like private things. You shouldn't, just because you took certain economic steps, suddenly be subject to a whole deluge of advertisements. And, and that's maybe even the most benign case. You can also imagine denial of care for certain persons because we don't like their political views, so we won't admit them to our hospital or something like that. Like, this is all crazy. We need some level of personal privacy over our financial transactions. Now, I don't think Bitcoin is a disaster because I do think there are ways to build layers on top of Bitcoin that will allow people to transact in Bitcoin privately. But I think it's also interesting that there are these other projects like Zcash, like Monero, that create a new base layer that has privacy baked into the way the blockchain validates itself by default. But still the regulators went after Monero and all these privacy points. Well, uh, what do you mean by went after Monero? Uh, like it seems uh, some time ago some uh, exchanges deleted Monero because it's privacy points. So that's, that's a, a very complex issue. And this is part of the problem with the way we do financial surveillance regulation. We sort of expect the government to lean on intermediaries to stop activities that are quote unquote illicit or money laundering. And this marriage of government and corporate control is not always transparent in itself. So like, I, I don't think I can point to a specific order from US authorities telling exchanges that they can't trade privacy coins. That order doesn't exist. Uh, so, not that specific order, but just in general. No, it's right. We, we see the results because examiners of financial institutions, like, um, like the IRS when they do examinations on behalf of FinCEN, or the OCC when they examine banks, mm -hmm. they basically say to the bank, hey, we see you have this cryptocurrency exchange as one of your customers. Do you know if they know all their customers? And even if they come back and say, yes, they know all their customers, they'll say, well, are they trading anything that makes it hard to know who they're sending money to? Like privacy coins? And they'll say, well, maybe that's not great. You gotta do heightened due diligence. At, what, at, at some point in that chain of examinations of customers and customers of customers, a lot of private companies, like exchanges, just figure it's not worth it for them to keep doing this activity that gets them extra scrutiny from their examiners, and so they tend to delist. It's hard to fight that. And the point of crypto was to get rid of intermediaries. So it's hard to come forward and say like, you should, like, exchanges should have a right to banking accounts, even if they're trading crypto, uh, cryptocurrency that's private. Like the point, no, the point is we shouldn't have to rely on these trusted intermediaries. And so like, we're at this point where we have this problem. We're still reliant on these trusted centralized intermediaries, mm -hmm. and you have examinations of their activities that tend to be a little bit aggressive, and then they don't always act in the best interest of their customers, sticking up and saying, no, I want them to have a right to trade this privacy protected you know, asset because it's good for human dignity, it's good for whatever. They say, oh, well, we're just not making enough money off of it, so we'll just drop it. There may also be actual legal orders, some of which might be secret, saying you can't trade these things. And to the extent those exist, I would be very interested in learning about them so we can actually directly fight them. Because once there's an actual legal order, it has to have a base in law. Once it's not, uh, you, you're, you're getting a D in your examination instead of a C. That's hard to fight. But if there's an actual legal order, it would be worth fighting. So, you know, I haven't seen a legal order that direct from the US government anyway, that says no one is allowed to trade Monero or, or make markets in Monero for their customers. If that legal order existed, I think we'd have a lot of constitutional and statutory arguments why it's invalid. But it doesn't answer the bigger question of like, well, what if the exchange just voluntarily decides to get rid of this headache and stop trading the thing? It's hard to fight that. And uh, what's your opinion on the future of these privacy points? Because some other uh, developers developing their own solutions of the privacy points. So my opinion on the future is that all cryptocurrencies will be privacy coins. 
even Bitcoin, you know, I think you could. Uh, I would say it's probably just layers on top of Bitcoin to make it private. Or right, because it's like very difficult to actually. Zero knowledge proofs for yeah. Bitcoin, zero knowledge proofs, different roll ups, and etc. It may just end up being layers on top of Bitcoin. You could imagine Bitcoin's core finally adopting some sort of privacy into the protocol. Granted, Bitcoin doesn't make such radical changes to its core protocol very often. But I think Blockstream does something on uh, the ZK space for Bitcoin. Probably. I don't know their line of business that well, but that wouldn't surprise me. Um, but basically what I'm saying is it's very clear that we can't live in a world where every financial transaction we make is immediately available for the public to inspect mm -hmm. all the time and into the perpetual future. Like, you can't delete the blockchain. Nobody's going to want that system. Yeah. And so the only cryptocurrencies that will survive are those that actually afford their users real privacy. And then, then the inevitable question is, well, will regulators and investigators be okay with that? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, hopefully we'll find a happy medium some form of selective disclosure like you can do on Zcash or other privacy protecting coins where under certain situations you are obligated by law to make a tra transparent transaction but you're always free to make a private transaction when it's a situation that's just a private intimate matter and not something that's due to be reported to the government something like that. Yeah. And are there any talks in the government now regarding different zero knowledge proofs applications So not yet? Well Nothing, nothing like immediate and pertinent to actual policy making. Um, FinCEN has written, which is the financial crimes uh, policy maker in Treasury, FinCEN has written all the way back in 2019 about anonymizing software providers, saying that they are not under current Bank Secrecy Act laws financial institutions because they are just publishing anonymizing or privacy protecting software. That's an excellent example of really good government policy towards a difficult, you know, topic area, which is you know, like the emergence of these more private transaction capabilities and how are we going to regulate them. And they offered a lot of clarity there. They simultaneously said, look, if you're a centralized mixer or tumbler, and you people trust you to anonymize and hand back the money, because you're taking custody of the money, you are a money transmitter, and so you do need to register with us and you do need to know all of your customers. So that's, that's what you asked for an example of discussions about zero knowledge proofs. It wasn't specifically about zero knowledge proofs because like Monero works on ring signatures, not zero knowledge proofs. Zcash works on zero knowledge proofs. But that's one area where this has come up and we've actually seen good results from policy. I think another area where it will inevitably come up is with questions of scaling blockchain networks. There's no direct government regulatory uh, attachment to that, unlike maybe questions of anti-money laundering, so it's not going to be as directly in conversations in DC. But to the extent you have, say, the, say you have the um, Commerce Committee in Congress, either the House or the Senate, discussing like more commercial uses of these technologies, those commercial uses are not going to materialize until you can actually get the benefit of a blockchain computation, like an NFT or whatever, without paying a huge fee. So a lot of the a lot of the promises that have been made by people in this industry about how like we're going to do digital ID, we're going to do decentralized social networks are only going to come to fruition once we have the sort of scale that potentially zero knowledge proofs can enable. And there's a bunch of like layer two developers on top of Ethereum, like Starknet from Starkware, like Polygon, like Aztec. The people developing these are using zero knowledge proofs in a different way in a way to hopefully allow more throughput to the blockchain, which will finally get us more commercial, non-financial use cases. And that will be very interesting to people in Congress because when it's just a discussion about financial regulation, it's a very serious conversation about financial crimes and fraud. If you can also have a conversation about all the other non-financial use cases that this technology supports, like a freer, more open internet, better platforms for self-expression, better platforms for social networking, because God knows the ones we have are really centralized and lousy and abuse our trust all the time, then you could have a much fuller conversation with people in Congress and at the agencies, maybe the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission that regulate more commercial type activities about the benefits of this technology. But if you try to have that conversation five years ago, let alone maybe even now, they go like, okay, well, where are people actually doing this? I, no one's going to pay a $20 transaction fee in order to like a post on the social, yeah. on a decentralized social network. So, we're, you know, this is another area that is going to be relevant, I think, 
but we're only just now getting there because we're only just now getting real scaling solutions on top of Ethereum or, or de novo blockchains like Avalanche or whatever. And what are your thoughts about NFTs? This area it still remains some kind of unregulated. Uh, are there any discussions uh, in uh, DC about that, about the approach to regulation of NFTs? I mean, to the extent an NFT is just digital art, it's generally speaking unregulated. Um, because art is generally speaking unregulated. There may actually be, in some cases, some amount of financial surveillance rules that need to be put in place because people do do money laundering with art and things like that. And we would hope that those regulations would be reasonable and comparable to the physical art world, right? Mm -hmm. But that's a longer conversation. In general, NFTs and their relation to like investor protection and securities laws that's an interesting topic. I think a lot of people assume that an NFT is not a security because it's non-fungible, so each unit is different, and so the investors don't share um, pro rata in the profits of the enterprise as a whole. But you can certainly imagine some NFT series where they're basically all the same, and when one of them gets valuable, all the rest of them get valuable. At that point, then it starts to look like it fits the common enterprise prong of the investor protection of the, the Howey test for securities in the U.S. And at that point, the SEC might actually have jurisdiction over the issuers and the secondary markets for those NFTs. But it's sort of as, like, we've already got all these hard questions about tokens. Uh, barring some finding of, like, rampant fraud in the NFT space, um, is this something that should be a priority for the SEC? I'm not sure. Uh, maybe not. And how do you so generally, the development of uh, digital assets and blockchain space in the US, Ramani talks that uh, there is now outflow of the talent of the developers from the US and there will be much more to other jurisdictions. So, uh, which jurisdictions uh, do you consider the to be the most advanced in terms of regulations of crypto and uh, what so, should be done? <laughs> I'm sad because I'm a fairly patriotic American. And for a long time, when someone would ask me that question, I point blank say to them, it's still the U.S. The U.S. is still the best home. And part of me still believes that for the very specific reason that if, if what you want to do in crypto is publish software, and that's it, the U.S. is still your best place to be. Because if all you're doing is publishing software, you will have the benefit of our very strong constitutional protections for free speech, which do not exist as clearly in the EU or in the UK or in East Asia. Like in many of these areas, you have some sort of general statement of, yeah, we have free speech in this country, but the government is much more capable of making restrictive laws that chill speech and there being no real way to challenge them on constitutional grounds. In the US, there's this huge body of case law, a lot of it because of our civil rights movement and people's, people who wanted to associate to fight segregation and things like that. We can build on that body of law and we continue to build on that body of law to defend people who are really just putting out information to the world because they are passionate about it, because they have political views, because they have ideas about better ways to organize society. And in the US, you can't tell people they're not allowed to speak unless they first get permission or unless they first get a license. So if what you want to do in crypto is software development, come to the US. Mm -hmm. I can find five different lawyers who'd be happy to defend you if you get in trouble for just publishing speech, because we all want to fight that fight. Mm -hmm. If what you want to do is run an exchange, especially a custodial exchange, where you're definitely going to be regulated, the US is not a good place, because the ambiguity about securities versus commodities laws, the ambiguity about which tokens are securities, the ambiguity about if I'm a registered securities exchange, am I allowed to trade any non-securities like Bitcoin? Like, it's a mess. Like right now, there was but a... It sounds like yeah. US customers uh, don't get these benefits and wouldn't be able to get access to crypto at all this way unless they use some decentralized exchanges. I mean, we'll see. So there is that as a backstop. And I think there are ways to ensure that the SEC does not wrongly assert its jurisdiction over truly decentralized exchange, in which case Americans would continue to and would always be able to use these assets truly decentralized, which is the point of the network to begin with. However, there are some other protocols like one each, uh, uh, which don't allow US customers to use uh, them, the aggregator. Oh, I'm, I'm not familiar with them. Uh, so one each, uh, the decentralized exchange aggregator, uh, but like, the best, uh, automatically pick up the best price for you from the, all the decentralized exchanges. Um, they like, 
raised 200, over 200 million. Yeah. Uh, probably top 100 current market cap. Uh, but uh, the, uh, they don't have US customers. Like, okay, maybe they. Well, they but if have, they're a decentralized but, exchange, they don't have any customers. Uh, well, like, it's possible to find it, but officially, if you are in the US and you enter their website, it, uh, it uh, wouldn't be open for you. Right. So they ban this way. But if I wanted to use their services and they are actually decentralized, I should be able to form a valid transaction on the Ethereum blockchain using whatever smart contracts they've created and uh, do it. Well, probably if you use this VPN, then you will be able to... No, 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 no. Because the, the VPN would be getting around their geo-blocking for their yeah. website. Yeah. And their website's a centralized product. Mm -hmm. um, and they've taken the maybe prudent step of not allowing Americans to visit their website. Although I would argue that that might be too overcautious with respect to the SEC's jurisdiction over them. But I'm not their lawyer and they can do whatever they want. Now, if they are, de I don't know anything about their business, so I don't want to, you know. If, if we're talking about a truly decentralized exchange, it doesn't matter what the front end of the website says. It doesn't matter whether I can get access to it. There should be a protocol spec for how the smart contracts that they've created works. And I independently should be able to form a valid transaction that would do whatever that protocol does um, using whatever assets I control in my unhosted, my self-hosted wallet. So the front end is one thing. But if the thing is really decentralized, there should be actually a way for Americans to use it. Okay, thank you for explaining such complicated things to us, and thank you for fighting for better relations. <laughs> yeah. No, those are great questions. Thank you for interviewing me. Okay.